THE WIND IN THE WILLOWS by Kenneth Graham Chapter 8 Toad's Adventures When Toad found himself immured in a dank and noisome dungeon, and knew that all the grim darkness of a medieval forest lay between him and the outer world of sunshine and well-metalled high roads where he had been lately so happy, disporting himself as if he had bought up every road in England. He flung himself at full length on the floor, and shed bitter tears, and abandoned himself to dark despair. This is the end of everything, he said. At least it is the end of the career of Toad, which is the same thing. The popular and handsome Toad, the rich and hospitable Toad, the Toad so free and careless and debonair. How can I hope to be ever set at large again, he said, who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor-car in, in such an audacious manner, and for such lurid and imaginative cheek, bestowed upon such a number of fat, red-faced policemen. Here his sobs choked him. <laughs> Stupid animal that I was, he said. Now I must languish in this dungeon till people who were proud to say they knew me have forgotten the very name of Toad. Oh, wise old badger, he said. Oh, clever, intelligent rat and sensible mole. What sound judgments, what a knowledge of men and matters you possess, O oh, unhappy and forsaken toad! With lamentations such as these, he passed his days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals or intermediate light refreshments, though the grim and ancient jailer, knowing that toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts, and indeed luxuries, could buy arrangement be sent in, at a price, from outside. Now the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. She was particularly fond of animals, and besides her canary, whose cage hung on a nail in the massive wall of the keep by day, to the great annoyance of prisoners who relished an after-dinner nap, and was shrouded in an antimagasser on the parlour-table at night, she kept several piebald mice and a restless revolving squirrel. This kind-hearted girl, pitying the misery of Toad, said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy, and getting so thin, you let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand, and sit up, and uh, do all sorts of things. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. He was tired of Toad, and his sulks, and his airs, and his meanness, so that very day she went on her errand of mercy, and knocked at the door of Toad's cell. Now, cheer up, Toad, she said coaxingly, on entering, and sit up and dry your eyes, and be a sensible animal, and do try and eat a bit of dinner. See, I brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. Hmm. It was bubble and squeak between two plates, and its fragrance filled the narrow cell. The penetrating smell of cabbage reached the nose of Toad, as he lay prostrate in his misery on the floor, 
and gave him the idea for a moment that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he had imagined. But still he wailed and kicked with his legs and refused to be comforted. So the wise girl retired for the time, but, of course, a good deal of the smell of hot cabbage remained behind, as it will do, and Toad, between his sobs, sniffed and reflected, and gradually began to think new and inspiring thoughts of chivalry and poetry and deeds still to be done, of broad meadows and cattle browsing in them, raked by sun and wind, of kitchen gardens and straight herb borders, and warm snapdragon beset by bees, and of the comforting chink and clink of dishes set down on the table at Toad Hall, and the scrape of chair legs on the floor as every one pulled himself close up to his work. The air of the narrow cell took a rosy tinge. He began to think of his friends, and how they would surely be able to do something of lawyers, and how they would have enjoyed his case, and what an ass he had been not to get in a few. And, lastly, he thought of his own great cleverness and resource, and all that he was capable of, if only he gave his great mind to it, and the cure was almost complete. When the girl returned, some hours later, she carried a tray, with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it, and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, very brown on both sides, with the butter running through the holes in great golden drops, like honey from the honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast simply talked to Toad, and with no uncertain voice, talked of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright frosty mornings, of cozy parlor firesides on winter evenings, when one's ramble was over, and slippered feet were propped on the fender, of the purring of contented cats, and the twitter of sleepy canaries. Toad sat up on end once more, dried his eyes, sipped his tea, and munched his toast, and soon began talking freely about himself, and the house he lived in, and his doings there, and how important he was, and what a lot of his friends thought about him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was, and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall, said she. It sounds beautiful. Toad Hall, said the Toad proudly, is an eligible, self-contained gentleman's residence, very unique, dating in part from the fourteenth century, but replete with every modern convenience, up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office, and golf links, suitable for, bless the animal, said the girl, laughing, I don't want to take it. Tell me something real about it. But first, wait till I fetch you some more tea and toast. She tripped away, and presently returned with a fresh trayful, and Toad, pitching into the toast with avidity, his spirits quite restored to their usual level, told her all about the boat-house and the fish-pond, and the old walled kitchen garden, and about the pigsties, and the stables, and the pigeon house, and the hen house, and about the dairy, and the wash house, and the china cupboards, and the linen presses, she liked that bit especially, and about the banqueting hall, 
and the fun they had all had there when the other animals were gathered around the table and Toad was at his best, singing songs, telling stories, and carrying on generally. Then she wanted to know about his animal friends, and was very interested in all he had to tell her about them, and how they lived, and what they did to pass their time. Of course, she did not say she was fond of animals as pets, because she had the sense to see that Toad would be extremely offended. When she said good night, having filled his water jug and shaken up his straw for him, Toad was very much the same sanguine, self-satisfied animal that he had been of old. He sang a little song or two, of the sort he used to sing at his dinner parties, curled himself up in the straw, and had an excellent night's rest in the pleasantest of dreams. They had many interesting talks together after that, as the dreary days went on, and the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad and thought it a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very trivial offence. Toad, of course, in his vanity, thought that her interest in him proceeded from a growing tenderness, and he could not help half regretting that the social gulf between them was so very wide for she was a comely lass, and evidently admired him very much. One morning the girl was very thoughtful, and answered at random, and did not seem to Toad to be paying proper attention to his witty sayings and sparkling comments. Toad, she said presently, just listen, please. I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. There, there, said Toad, graciously and affably. Never mind. Think no more about it. I have several aunts who mm, ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute, Toad, said the girl. You talk too much. That's your chief fault. And I'm trying to think. And you hurt my head. As I said, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. She does the washing for all the prisoners in this castle. We try to keep any pain business of that sort in the family, you understand. She takes out the washing on Monday morning and brings it in on Friday evening. This is Thursday. Now, this is what occurs to me. You're very rich. At least you're always telling me so. And she's very poor. A few pounds wouldn't make any difference to you, and it would mean a lot to her. Now, I think, if she were properly approached, squared, I believe, is the word you animals use, you would come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet, and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many aspects, particularly about the figure. We're not, said the toad in a huff. I have a very elegant figure, for what I am. So has my aunt, replied the for what she is. But have it your own way, you horrid, proud, ungrateful animal, when I'm sorry for you and trying to help you? Yes, yes, uh, that, that's all right. Thank you very much indeed, said the toad hurriedly. But look here. You wouldn't surely have Mr. Toad of Toad Hall going about the country disguised as a washerwoman? "'Then you can stop here as a toad,' replied the girl with much spirit. "'I suppose you want to go off in a coach and four.' 
honest Toad was always ready to admit himself in the wrong. "'You are a good, kind, clever girl,' he said, "'and I am indeed a proud and stupid Toad. "'Introduce me to your worthy aunt, and, if you will be so kind, I have no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both parties. Next evening the girl ushered her aunt into Toad's cell, and, bearing his week's washing, pinned up in a towel. The old lady had been prepared beforehand for the interview, and the sight of certain gold sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table in full view, practically completed the matter, and left little further to discuss. In return for his cash, Toad received a cotton-print gown, an apron, a shawl, and a rusty black bonnet, the only stipulation the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped down in a corner. By this not very convincing artifice, she explained, aided by picturesque fiction, which she could supply herself, she hoped to retain her situation in spite of the suspicious appearance of things. Toad was delighted with the suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style, and with his reputation for being a desperate and dangerous fellow, untarnished. And he readily helped the jailer's daughter to make her aunt appear as much as possible, the victim of circumstances over which she had no control. Now it's your turn, Toad, said the girl. Take off that coat and waistcoat of yours. You're fat enough as it is. Shaking with laughter, she proceeded to hook and eye him into the cotton-print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings to the rusty bonnet under his chin. You're the very image of her, she giggled, only... I'm sure you never looked half so respectable in all your life before. Now, good-bye, Toad, and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up, and if anyone says anything to you, as they probably will, being but men, you can chaff back a bit, of course, but remember you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. With a quaking heart, but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most hare-brained and hazardous undertaking, but he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that both his popularity and the sex that seemed to inspire it were really another's. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. Even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take, he found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate, anxious to be off to his tea, summoning him to come along sharp and not keep him waiting there all night. The chaff and the humorous sallies to which he was subjected, and to which, of course, he had to provide prompt and effective reply, formed, indeed, his chief danger. For Toad was an animal with a strong sense of his own dignity, and the chaff was mostly, he thought, poor and clumsy, and the humor of the sallies entirely lacking. 
However, he kept his temper, though with great difficulty, suited his retorts to his company and his supposed character, and did his best not to overstep the limits of good taste. It seemed hours before he crossed that last courtyard, rejected the pressing invitations from the last guard-room, and dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with simulated passion for just one farewell embrace. But at last he heard the wicket gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly towards the lights of the town, not knowing in the least what he should do next, only quite certain of one thing, that he must remove himself as quickly as possible from the neighborhood where the lady he was forced to represent was so well known, and so popular a character. As he walked along, considering his attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off, to one side of the town, and the sound of the puffing and snorting of engines in the banging of shunted trucks on his ear. Aha! he thought. This is a piece of luck. A railway station is the thing I want most in the whole world at this moment. And, what's more, I needn't go through the town to get it, and shan't have to report this humiliating character by repartees which, though thoroughly effective, do not assist one's sense of self-respect. He made his way to the station accordingly, consulted a timetable, and found that a train, bound more or less in the direction of his home, was due to start in half an hour. Ah, more luck, said Toad, his spirits rising rapidly and went off to the booking office to buy his ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be nearest to the village of which Toad Hall was the principal feature, and mechanically put his fingers in search of the necessary money where his waistcoat pocket should have been. But here the cotton gown which had nobly stood by him so far in which he had basely forgotten, intervened and frustrated his efforts. In a sort of nightmare he struggled with the strange, uncanny thing that seemed to hold his hands, turned all muscular strivings to water, and laugh at him all the time, while other travellers, forming up the line behind, waited with impatience making suggestions of more or less value, and comments of more or less stringency and point. At last, somehow, he never rightly understood how, he burst the barriers, attained the goal, arrived at where all waistcoat pockets are eternally situated, and found not only no money, but no pocket to hold it in, and no waistcoat to hold the pocket. To his horror, he recollected that he had left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his cell, and with them his pocket-book, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil-case, all that makes life worth living, all that distinguishes the many-pocketed animal, the lord of creation, from the inferior, one-pocketed, or no-pocketed, productions that hop or trip about, permissibly, unequipped for the real contest. In his misery he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and with a return to his fine old manner, 
a blend of the squire and the college don. He said, Look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me that ticket, will you, and I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him, and the rusty black bonnet a moment, and then laughed. I should think you were pretty well known in these parts, he said. If you've tried this game on often, here, stand away from the window, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. An old gentleman, who had been prodding him in the back for some moments, here thrust him away, and what was worse, addressed him as his good woman, which anger towed more than anything that had occurred that evening. Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing, and tears trickled down each side of his nose. It was hard, he thought, to be within sight of safety and almost of home, and to be balked by the want of a few wretched shillings, and by the pettifogging mistrustfulness of paid officials. Very soon his escape would be discovered, the hunt would be up, he would be caught reviled, <laughs> loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison, and bread and water and straw. His guards and penalties would be doubled, and oh, what sarcastic remarks the girl would make! What was to be done? He was not swift of foot. His figure was, unfortunately, recognizable. Could he not squeeze under the seat of a carriage? He had seen this method adopted by schoolboys, when the journey money provided by thoughtful parents had been diverted to other and better ends. As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man, with an oil can in one hand, and a lump of cotton waste in the other. "'Hello, mother,' said the engine driver. "'What's the trouble?' You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir, said Toad, crying afresh, I am a poor, unhappy washerwoman, and I've lost all my money, and can't pay for a ticket, and I must get home tonight somehow, and whatever I am to do, I don't know. Oh, dear, oh, dear. That's a bad business indeed, said the engine driver, reflectively. Lost your money, and can't get home, and got some kids, too, waiting for you, I, I dare say. Uh, any amount of em, sobbed Toad, and they'll be hungry, and playing with matches, and <laughs> upsetting lamps, the, the little innocents, and quarreling, and going on generally. Oh! Dear, oh dear. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. Very well, that's that. And I'm an engine driver, as you well may see. And there's no denying it's terribly dirty work. Uses up a power of shirts, it does till my missus is fair tired of washing em. If you'll wash a few shirts for me when you get home, and send em along, I'll give you a ride on my engine. It's against the company regulations, but we're not so very particular in these out-of-the-way parts. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he had never washed a shirt in his life, and couldn't if he tried, and anyhow, he wasn't going to begin. But he thought, 
when I get safely home into Toad Hall, and have money again and pockets to put it in, I will send the engine driver enough uh, to pay for quite a quantity of washing, and that will be the same thing or better. The guard waved his welcome flag, the engine driver whistled in cheerful response, and the train moved out of the station. As the speed increased, and the toad could see, on either side of him, real fields and trees and hedges and cows and horses all flying past him, and as he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall, and sympathetic friends, and money to chink in his pocket, and a soft bed to sleep in, good things to eat, and praise and admiration at the recital of his adventures and his surpassing cleverness, he began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song, to the great astonishment of the engine driver, who had come across washerwomen before at long intervals, but never one at all like this, covered many and many a mile. And Toad was already considering what he would have for supper as soon as he got home, when he noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. Then he saw him climb on the coals and gaze out over the top of the train. Then he returned and said to Toad, "'It's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight. Yet I could be sworn that I heard another following us.' Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. He became grave and depressed, and a dull pain in the lower part of his spine, communicating itself to his legs, made him want to sit down and try desperately not to think of all the possibilities. By this time the moon was shining brightly, and the engine driver, steadying himself on the coal, could command a view of the line behind them for a long distance. Presently he called out, I can see it clearly now. It is an engine on our rails, coming along at a great pace. It looks as if we are being pursued. The miserable toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do, with dismal want of success. They are gaining fast, cried the engine driver, and the engine is crowded with the queerest lot of people, men like ancient warders, waving halberds, policemen in their helmets, waving truncheons, and shabbily dressed men in pot-hats, obvious and unmistakable, plain-clothes detectives, even at this distance, waving revolvers and walking-sticks, all waving and all shouting the same thing. Stop! 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 Then Toad fell on his knees among the coals, and, raising his clasped paws in supplication, cried, Save me, only save me, dear, kind Mr. Engine Driver, and I will confess everything. I am not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me, innocent or otherwise. I am a toad, the well-known and popular Mr. Toad, a landed proprietor. I have just escaped, by my great daring and cleverness, from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies had flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it will be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor, unhappy, innocent Toad. The engine driver looked down upon him very sternly and said, Now, tell the truth. What were you put in prison for? "'It was nothing very much,' said poor Toad, colouring deeply. "'I only borrowed a motor-car while the owners were at lunch. "'They had no need of it at the time. "'I didn't mean to steal it, really, but people 
especially magistrates, take such harsh views of thoughtless and high-spirited actions. The engine-driver looked very grave, and said, I fear that you have been indeed a wicked toad, and by rights I ought to give you up to offended justice. But you are evidently in sore trouble and distress, so I will not desert you. I don't hold with motor-cars, for one thing, and I don't hold with being ordered about by policemen when I'm on my own engine for another, and the sight of an animal in tears always makes me feel queer and soft-hearted, so cheer up, Toad, I'll do my best, and we may beat them yet. They piled on more coals, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew. The engine leapt and swung, and still their pursuers slowly gained. The engine driver, with a sigh, wiped his brow with a handful of cotton waste, and said, I'm afraid it's no good, Toad. You see, they are running light, and they have the better engine. There's just one thing left for us to do, and it's your only chance, so attend very carefully to what I tell you. A short way ahead of us is a long tunnel, and, on the other side of that, the line passes through a thick wood. Now, I will put on all the speed I can while we are running through the tunnel, but the other fellows will slow down a bit, naturally, for fear of an accident. When we are through, I will shut off steam and put on brakes as hard as I can, and the moment it's safe for you to do so, you must jump and hide in the woods, before they get through the tunnel and see you. Then I will go full speed ahead, and they can chase me if they like, for as long as they like, and as far as they like. Now, mind and be ready to jump when I tell you. They piled on more coals, and the train shot into the tunnel, and the engine rushed and roared and rattled, till at last they shot out at the other end into the fresh air and the peaceful moonlight, and saw the wood lying dark and helpful upon either side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on brakes. The toad got down on the step, and as the train slowed down to almost a walking pace, he heard the driver call out, Now, jump! Toad jumped, rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt, scrambled into the wood, and hid. Peeping out, he saw his train get up speed again and disappear at a great pace. Then out of the tunnel burst the pursuing engine, roaring and whistling, her motley crew waving their various weapons and shouting, Stop! 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 When they were past, the toad had a hearty laugh, for the first time since he was thrown into prison. But he soon stopped laughing when he came to consider that it was now very late, and dark and cold, and he was in an unknown wood, with no money and no chance of supper, and still far from friends and home, and the dead silence of everything after the roar and rattle of the train was something of a shock. He dared not leave the shelter of the trees, so he struck into the wood with the idea of leaving the railway as far as possible behind him. After so many weeks within walls, he found the wood strange and unfriendly, and inclined, he thought, to make fun of him. Night jars, sounding their mechanical rattle, made him think that the wood was full of searching warders closing in on him. An owl, swooping noiselessly towards him, brushed his shoulder with its wing, making him jump with the horrid certainty that it was a hand, and then flitted off, moth-like, laughing its low, Hoo! 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 which Toad thought in very poor taste. Once he met a fox, who stopped, looked him up and down in a sarcastic sort of way, and said, Hello, washerwoman. Half a pair of socks and a pillow short this week. Mind it doesn't occur again. And swaggered off, sniggering. Toad looked about for a stone 
to throw at him, but could not succeed in finding one, which vexed him more than anything. At last, cold, hungry, and tired out, he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, where, with branches and dead leaves, he made himself as comfortable a bed as he could, and slept soundly till the morning. End of chapter 8 Toad's Adventures Read by Denny Sayers in Modesto, California Spring of 2006The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham Chapter 9 Wayfarers All The water rat was restless, and he did not exactly know why. To all appearance the summer's pomp was still at fullest height, and although in the tilled acres green had given way to gold, the rowans were reddening, and the woods were dashed here and there with a tawny fierceness, Yet light and warmth and color were still present in undiminished measure, clean of any chilly premonitions of the passing year. But the constant chorus of the orchards and hedges had shrunk to a casual evensong from a few yet unwearied performers. The robin was beginning to assert himself once more, and there was a feeling in the air of change and departure. The cuckoo, of course, had long been silent, but many another feathered friend, for months a part of the familiar landscape and its small society, was missing too, and it seemed that the ranks thinned steadily day by day. Rat, ever observant of all winged movement, saw that it was taking daily a southing tendency, and even as he lay in bed at night he thought he could make out, passing in the darkness overhead, the beat and quiver of impatient pinions, obedient to the peremptory call. Nature's grand hotel has its season, like the others. As the guests, one by one, pack, pay, and depart, and the seats at the table d'hote shrink pitifully at each succeeding meal. As suites of rooms are closed, carpets taken up, and waiters sent away. Those boarders who are staying on, on pension, until the next year's full reopening, cannot help being somewhat affected by all these flittings and farewells, this eager discussion of plans, routes, and fresh quarters, this daily shrinkage in the stream of comradeship. One gets unsettled, depressed, and inclined to be querulous. Why this craving for change? Why not stay on quietly here, like us, and be jolly? You don't know this hotel out of the season, and what fun we have among ourselves, we fellows who remain and see the whole interesting year out. "'Oh, very true, no doubt,' the others always reply. "'We quite envy you, and some other year, perhaps. "'But just now we have engagements. "'And there's the bus at the door. "'Our time is up.' "'So they depart, with a smile and a nod, "'and we miss them, and feel resentful. "'The rat was a self-sufficing sort of animal, "'rooted to the land, and whoever went, he stayed.' Still, he could not help noticing what was in the air, and feeling some of its influence in his bones. It was difficult to settle down to anything seriously, with all this flitting going on. Leaving the waterside, where rushes stood thick and tall in a stream that was becoming sluggish and low, he wandered countrywards, crossed a field or two of pasturage already looking dusty and parched, and thrust into the great sea of wheat, yellow, wavy, and murmurous, full of quiet motion and small whisperings. Here he often loved to wander, through the forest of stiff, strong stalks that carried their own golden sky away over his head, a sky that was always dancing, shimmering, softly talking, or swaying strongly to the passing wind and recovering itself with a toss and a merry laugh. Here, too, he had many small friends, a society complete in itself, leading full and busy lives, but always with a spare moment to gossip and exchange news with a visitor. Today, however, though they were civil enough, 
the field mice and harvest mice seemed preoccupied. Many were digging and tunneling busily. Others, gathered together in small groups, examined plans and drawings of small flats, stated to be desirable and compact, and situated conveniently near the stores. Some were hauling out dusty trunks and dress baskets. Others were already elbow-deep packing their belongings, while everywhere piles and bundles of wheat, oats, barley, beech-mast, and nuts lay about ready for transport. "'Here's old Ratty!' they cried as soon as they saw him. "'Come and bear a hand, Rat, and don't stand about idle!' "'What sort of games are you up to?' said the Water Rat severely. "'You know it isn't time to be thinking of winter quarters yet by a long way.' "'Oh, yes, we know that,' explained a field mouse rather shamefacedly. "'But it's always as well to be in good time, isn't it? "'We really must get all the furniture and baggage and stores moved out of this "'before those horrid machines begin clicking round the fields.' And then, you know, the best flats get picked up so quickly nowadays, and if you're late, you have to put up with anything. And they want such a lot of doing up, too, before they're fit to move into. Of course, we're early, we know that. But we're only just making a start. Oh, bother starts, said the rat. It's a splendid day. Come for a row, or a stroll along the hedges, or a picnic in the woods, or something. "'Well, I think not today, thank you,' replied the field mouse hurriedly. "'Perhaps some other day, when we've more time.' The rat, with a snort of contempt, swung round to go, tripped over a hat-box, and fell with undignified remarks. "'If people would be more careful,' said a field mouse rather stiffly, "'and look where they're going, people wouldn't hurt themselves. "'And forget themselves. Mind that hold all, rat!' You'd better sit down somewhere. In an hour or two we may be more free to attend to you. You won't be free, as you call it, much this side of Christmas, I can see that, retorted the rat grumpily, as he picked his way out of the field. He returned somewhat despondently to his river again, his faithful, steady-going old river, which never packed up, flitted, or went into winter quarters. In the osiers which fringed the bank, he spied a swallow sitting. Presently it was joined by another, and then by a third, and the birds, fidgeting restlessly on their bow, talked together, earnestly and low. "'What, already?' said the rat, strolling up to them. "'What's the hurry? I call it simply ridiculous.' "'Oh, we're not off yet, if that's what you mean,' replied the first swallow. "'We're only making plans and arranging things, talking it over, you know.' what route we're taking this year, and where we'll stop, and so on. That's half the fun. Fun, said the rat. Now that's just what I don't understand. If you've got to leave this pleasant place, and your friends who will miss you, and your snug homes that you've just settled into, why, when the hour strikes, I've no doubt you'll go bravely, and face all the trouble and discomfort and change and newness, and make believe that you're not very unhappy but to want to talk about it, or even think about it, till you really need... No, you don't understand, naturally, said the second swallow. First we feel it stirring within us, a sweet unrest. Then back come the recollections, one by one, like homing pigeons. They flutter through our dreams at night, they fly with us in our wheelings and circlings by day. We hunger to inquire of each other, to compare notes, and assure ourselves that it was all really true, as one by one the scents and sounds and names of long-forgotten places come gradually back and beckon to us. "'Couldn't you stop on for just this year?' suggested the Water Rat wistfully. "'We'll all do our best to make you feel at home. You've no idea what good times we have here while you are far away.' "'I tried stopping on one year,' said the third swallow. I had grown so fond of the place that when the time came I hung back and let the others go on without me. For a few weeks it was all well enough, but afterwards, oh, the weary length of the nights, the shivering, sunless days, the air so clammy and chill, and not an insect in an acre of it. No, it was no good. My courage broke down, and one cold, stormy night I took wing, 
flying well inland on account of the strong easterly gales. It was snowing hard as I beat through the passes of the great mountains, and I had a stiff flight to win through. But never shall I forget the blissful feeling of the hot sun again on my back as I sped down to the lakes that lay so blue and placid below me, and the taste of my first fat insect. The past was like a bad dream. The future was all happy holiday, as I moved southward, week by week, easily, lazily, lingering as long as I dared, but always heeding the call. No, I had had my warning, and never again did I think of disobedience. Ah, yes, the call of the south, of the south, twittered the other two dreamily. Its songs, its hues, its radiant air. Oh, do you remember? and forgetting the rat, they slid into passionate reminiscence, while he listened, fascinated, and his heart burned within him. In himself, too, he knew that it was vibrating at last, that chord hitherto dormant and unsuspected. The mere chatter of these southern-bound birds, their pale and second-hand reports, had yet power to awaken this wild new sensation, and thrill him through and through with it. What would one moment of the real thing work in him? One passionate touch of the real southern sun, one waft of the authentic odor. With closed eyes, he dared to dream a moment in full abandonment. And when he looked again, the river seemed steely and chill, the green fields gray and lightless. Then his loyal heart seemed to cry out on his weaker self for its treachery. "'Why do you ever come back, then, at all?' he demanded of the swallows jealously. "'What do you find to attract you in this poor, drab little country?' "'And do you think,' said the first swallow, "'that the other call is not for us, too, in its due season? "'The call of lush meadow-grass, wet orchards, warm, insect-haunted ponds, "'of browsing cattle, of haymaking?' and all the farm buildings clustering round the house of the perfect eaves. "'Do you suppose,' asked the second one, "'that you are the only living thing that craves with a hungry longing to hear the cuckoo's note again?' "'In due time,' said the third, "'we shall be homesick once more for quiet water-lilies swaying on the surface of an English stream. But to-day all that seems pale and thin and very far away.' Just now, our blood dances to other music. They fell a-twittering among themselves once more, and this time their intoxicating babble was a violet seas, tawny sands, and lizard-haunted walls. Restlessly, the rat wandered off once more, climbed the slope that rose gently from the north bank of the river, and lay looking out towards the great ring of downs that barred his vision further southwards. His simple horizon hitherto, his mountains of the moon, his limit behind which lay nothing he had cared to see or to know. Today, to him gazing south with a new-born need stirring in his heart, the clear sky over their long low outline seemed to pulsate with promise. Today, the unseen was everything, the unknown the only real fact of life. On this side of the hills was now the real blank. On the other lay the crowded and colored panorama that his inner eye was seeing so clearly. What seas lay beyond, green, leaping, and crested? What sun-bathed coasts along which the white villas glittered against the olive woods? What quiet harbors thronged with gallant shipping bound for purple islands of wine and spice, islands set low in languorous waters. He rose and descended riverwards once more, then changed his mind and sought the side of the dusty lane. There, lying half-buried in the thick, cool, under-hedged tangle that bordered it, he could muse on the metalled road and all the wondrous world that it led to on all the wayfarers, too, that might have trodden it, and the fortunes and adventures they had gone to seek, or found unseeking, out there beyond, beyond. Footsteps fell on his ear, 
and the figure of one that walked somewhat wearily came into view. And he saw that it was a rat, and a very dusty one. The wayfarer, as he reached him, saluted with a gesture of courtesy that had something foreign about it, hesitated a moment, then with a pleasant smile turned from the track and sat down by his side in the cool herbage. He seemed tired, and the rat let him rest unquestioned, understanding something of what was in his thoughts, knowing, too, the value all animals attach at times to mere silent companionship, when the weary muscles slacken and the mind marks time. The wayfarer was lean and keen-featured, and somewhat bowed at the shoulders. His paws were thin and long, his eyes much wrinkled at the corners, and he wore small gold earrings in his neatly set, well-shaped ears. His knitted jersey was of a faded blue, his breeches, patched and stained, were based on a blue foundation, and his small belongings that he carried were tied up in a blue cotton handkerchief. When he had rested a while, the stranger sighed, snuffed the air, and looked about him. "'That was clover, that warm whiff on the breeze,' he remarked, "'and those are cows we hear, cropping the grass behind us, and blowing softly between mouthfuls. There is a sound of distant reapers, and yonder rises a blue line of cottage smoke against the woodland. The river runs somewhere close by, for I hear the call of a moor-hen, and I see by your build that you are a freshwater mariner. Everything seems asleep, and yet going on all the time. It is a goodly life that you lead, friend. No doubt the best in the world, if only you are strong enough to lead it. Yes, it's the life the only life to live, responded the water rat dreamily, and without his usual whole-hearted conviction. I did not say exactly that, replied the stranger cautiously, but no doubt it's the best. I've tried it, and I know. And because I've just tried it, six months of it, and know it's the best, here I am, footsore and hungry, tramping away from it, tramping southward, following the old call, back to the old life, the life, which is mine, and which will not let me go. Is this, then, yet another of them? mused the rat. And where have you just come from? he asked. He hardly dared to ask where he was bound for. He seemed to know the answer only too well. Nice little farm, replied the wayfarer briefly, up along in that direction. He nodded northwards. Never mind about it. I had everything I could want, everything I had any right to expect of life and more. And here I am. Glad to be here all the same, though, glad to be here. So many miles further on the road, so many hours nearer to my heart's desire. His shining eyes held fast to the horizon, and he seemed to be listening for some sound that was wanting from that inland acreage vocal as it was with the cheerful music of pasturage and farmyard. "'You are not one of us,' said the water-rat, "'nor yet a farmer, nor even, I should judge, of this country.' "'Right,' replied the stranger, "'I'm a seafaring rat, I am, and the port I originally hail from is Constantinople, though I'm a sort of a foreigner there too, in a manner of speaking. "'You will have heard of Constantinople, friend.' a fair city, and an ancient and glorious one. And you may have heard, too, of Sigurd, king of Norway, and how he sailed thither with sixty ships, and how he and his men rode up through streets all canopied in their honour with purple and gold, and how the emperor and empress came down and banqueted with him on board his ship. When Sigurd returned home, many of his northmen remained behind and entered the emperor's bodyguard, and my ancestor, a Norwegian-born, stayed behind, too, with the ships that Sigurd gave the emperor. Seafarers we have ever been, and no wonder. As for me, the city of my birth is no more my home than any pleasant port between there and the London River. I know them all, and they know me. 
set me down on any of their quays or foreshores, and I am home again. I suppose you go great voyages, said the water rat with growing interest, months and months out of sight of land, and provisions running short, and allowance as to water, and your mind communing with the mighty ocean, and all that sort of thing? By no means, said the sea rat frankly. Such a life as you describe would not suit me at all. I'm in the coasting trade, and rarely out of sight of land. It's the jolly times on shore that appeal to me as much as any seafaring. Oh, those southern seaports, the smell of them, the riding lights at night, the glamour. Well, perhaps you have chosen the better way, said the water rat, but rather doubtfully. Tell me something of your coasting, then, if you have a mind to, and what sort of harvest an animal of spirit might hope to bring home from it, to warm his latter days with gallant memories by the fireside. For my life, I confess to you, feels to me to-day somewhat narrow and circumscribed. My last voyage, began the sea rat, that landed me eventually in this country, bound with high hopes for my inland farm, will serve as a good example of any of them, and indeed as an epitome of my highly coloured life. Family troubles, as usual, began it. The domestic storm cone was hoisted, and I shipped myself on board a small trading vessel bound from Constantinople by classic seas whose every wave throbs with a deathless memory, to the Grecian islands and the Levant. Those were golden days and balmy nights, in and out of harbour all the time, old friends everywhere, sleeping in some cool temple or ruined cistern during the heat of the day, feasting and song after sundown under great stars set in a velvet sky. Thence we turned and coasted up the Adriatic, its shores swimming in an atmosphere of amber, rose, and aquamarine. We lay in wide, land-locked harbours, we roamed through ancient and noble cities, until at last one morning, as the sun rose royally behind us, we rode into Venice, down a path of gold. Oh, Venice is a fine city, wherein a rat can wander at his ease and take his pleasure, or, when weary of wandering, can sit at the edge of the Grand Canal at night, feasting with his friends, when the air is full of music and the sky full of stars, and the lights flash and shimmer on the polished steel prows of the swaying gondolas, packed so that you could walk across the canal on them from side to side. And then the food. Do you like shellfish? Well, well, we won't linger over that now. He was silent for a time, and the water rat, silent too and enthralled, floated on dream canals and heard a phantom song pealing high between vaporous, grey, wave-lapped walls. Southwards we sailed again at last, continued the sea-rat, coasting down the Italian shore, till finally we made Palermo, and there I quitted for a long, happy spell on shore. I never stick too long to one ship. One gets narrow-minded and prejudiced. Besides, Sicily is one of my happy hunting grounds. I know everybody there, and their ways just suit me. I spent many jolly weeks in the island, staying with friends up country. When I grew restless again, I took advantage of a ship that was trading to Sardinia and Corsica, and very glad I was to feel the fresh breeze and the sea spray in my face once more. But isn't it very hot and stuffy down in the... Hold, I think you call it, asked the water rat. The seafarer looked at him with the suspicion of a wink. I'm an old hand, he remarked with much simplicity. The captain's cabin's good enough for me. It's a hard life by all accounts, murmured the rat, sunk in deep thought. For the crew it is, replied the seafarer gravely, again with the ghost of a wink. From Corsica, he went on, I made use of a ship that was taking wine to the mainland. We made Alasio in the evening, lay to, hauled up our wine casks, and hove them overboard, tied one to the other by a long line. 
then the crew took to the boats and rowed shorewards singing as they went and drawing after them the long bobbing procession of casks like a mile of porpoises on the sands they had horses waiting which dragged the casks up the steep street of the little town with a fine rush and clatter and scramble when the last cask was in we went and refreshed and rested and sat late into the night drinking with our friends and next morning i took to the great olive woods for a spell and a rest for now i had done with islands for the time and ports and shipping were plentiful so i led a lazy life among the peasants lying and watching them work or stretched high on the hillside with the blue mediterranean far below me and so at length by easy stages and partly on foot partly by sea to marseilles and the meeting of old shipmates and the visiting of great ocean-bound vessels and feasting once more talk of shellfish why sometimes i dream of the shellfish of marseilles and wake up crying that reminds me said the polite water rat you happened to mention that you were hungry and i ought to have spoken earlier of course you will stop and take your midday meal with me my hole is close by it is some time past noon and you are very welcome to whatever there is now i call that kind and brotherly of you said the sea rat i was indeed hungry when i sat down and ever since i inadvertently happened to mention shellfish my pangs have been extreme but couldn't you fetch it along out here i am none too fond of going under hatches unless i'm obliged to and then while we eat i could tell you more concerning my voyages and the pleasant life i lead at least it is very pleasant to me and by your attention i judge it commends itself to you whereas if we go indoors it is a hundred to one that i shall presently fall asleep that is indeed an excellent suggestion said the water rat and hurried off home there he got out the luncheon basket and packed a simple meal in which remembering the stranger's origin and preferences he took care to include a yard of long french bread a sausage out of which the garlic sang some cheese which lay down and cried and a long-necked straw-covered flask wherein lay bottled sunshine shed and garnered on far southern slopes thus laden he returned with all speed and blushed for pleasure at the old seaman's commendations of his taste and judgment as together they unpacked the basket and laid out the contents on the grass by the roadside the sea rat as soon as his hunger was somewhat assuaged continued the history of his latest voyage conducting his simple hearer from port to port of spain landing him at lisbon oporto and bordeaux introducing him to the pleasant harbours of cornwall and devon and so up the channel to that final quayside where landing after winds long contrary storm-driven and weather-beaten he had caught the first magical hints and heraldings of another spring and fired by these had sped on a long tramp inland hungry for the experiment of life on some quiet farmstead very far from the weary beating of any sea spellbound and quivering with excitement the water rat followed the adventurer league by league over stormy bays through crowded roadsteads across harbour bars on a racing tide up winding rivers that hid their busy little towns round a sudden turn and left him with a regretful sigh planted at his dull inland farm about which he desired to hear nothing by this time their meal was over and the seafarer refreshed and strengthened his voice more vibrant his eye lit with a brightness that seemed caught from some far-away sea-beacon, filled his glass with the red and glowing vintage of the south, and leaning towards the water-rat, compelled his gaze and held him, body and soul, while he talked. Those eyes were of the changing, foam-streaked, grey-green of leaping northern seas. In the glass shone a hot ruby that seemed the very heart of the south, 
beating for him who had courage to respond to its pulsation. The twin lights, the shifting gray and the steadfast red, mastered the water rat and held him bound, fascinated, powerless. The quiet world outside the rays receded far away and ceased to be. And the talk, the wonderful talk, flowed on. Or was it speech entirely, or did it pass at times into song? Chanty of the sailors weighing the dripping anchor, sonorous hum of the shrouds in a tearing northeaster, ballad of the fisherman hauling his nets at sundown against an apricot sky, chords of guitar and mandolin from gondola or kike. Did it change into the cry of the wind, plaintive at first, angrily shrill as it freshened, rising to a tearing whistle, sinking to a musical trickle of air from the leech of the bellying sail? All these sounds the spellbound listener seemed to hear, and with them the hungry complaint of the gulls and the sea mews, the soft thunder of the breaking wave, the cry of the protesting shingle. Back into speech again it passed, and with beating heart he was following the adventures of a dozen seaports, the fights, the escapes, the rallies, the comradeships, the gallant undertakings. Or he searched islands for treasure, fished in still lagoons, and dozed day long on warm white sand. Of deep sea fishings he heard tell, and mighty silver gatherings of the mile long net, of sudden perils, noise of breakers on a moonless night, or the tall boughs of the great liner taking shape overhead through the fog, of the merry homecoming, the headland rounded, the harbor lights opened out the groups seen dimly on the quay, the cheery hail, the splash of the hawser, the trudge up the steep little street towards the comforting glow of red-curtained windows. Lastly, in his waking dream, it seemed to him that the adventurer had risen to his feet, but was still speaking, still holding him fast with his sea-gray eyes. And now, he was softly saying, I take to the road again, holding on southwestwards for many a long and dusty day, till at last I reach the little grey sea-town I know so well that clings along one steep side of the harbour. There, through dark doorways, you look down flights of stone steps, overhung by great pink tufts of valerian and ending in a patch of sparkling blue water. The little boats that lie tethered to the rings and stanchions of the old sea-wall are gaily painted, as those I clambered in and out of in my own childhood. The salmon leap on the flood-tide, schools of mackerel flash and play past quaysides and foreshores, and by the windows the great vessels glide night and day up to their moorings or forth to the open sea. There, sooner or later, the ships of all seafaring nations arrive, and there, at its destined hour, the ship of my choice will let go its anchor. I shall take my time, I shall tarry and bide, till at last the right one lies waiting for me, warped out into midstream, loaded low, her bowsprit pointing down harbour. I shall slip on board, by boat or a long hawser. And then, one morning, I shall wake to the song and tramp of the sailors, the clink of the capstan, and the rattle of the anchor-chain coming merrily in. We shall break out the jib and the foresail. The white houses on the harbour-side will glide slowly past us as she gathers steering way, and the voyage will have begun. As she forges toward the headland, she will clothe herself with canvas. And then, once outside, the sounding slap of great green seas as she heels to the wind, pointing south. And you... You will come too, young brother, for the days pass and never return, and the south still waits for you. Take the adventure, heed the call, now ere the irrevocable moment passes. Tis but a banging of the door behind you, a blithesome step forward, and you are out of the old life and into the new. Then some day, some day long hence, Jog home here if you will, 
when the cup has been drained and the play has been played and sit down by your quiet river with a store of goodly memories for company you can easily overtake me on the road for you are young and i am aging and go softly i will linger and look back and at last i will surely see you coming eager and light-hearted with all the south in your face the voice died away and ceased as an insect's tiny trumpet dwindled swiftly into silence and the water rat paralyzed and staring saw at last but a distant speck on the white surface of the road mechanically he rose and proceeded to repack the luncheon basket carefully and without haste mechanically he returned home gathered together a few small necessaries and special treasures he was fond of and put them in a satchel acting with slow deliberation moving about the room like a sleepwalker listening ever with parted lips he swung the satchel over his shoulder carefully selected a stout stick for his wayfaring and with no haste but with no hesitation at all he stepped across the threshold just as the mole appeared at the door why where are you off to ratty asked the mole in great surprise grasping him by the arm going south with the rest of them murmured the rat in a dreamy monotone never looking at him seawards first and then on shipboard and so to the shores that are calling me he pressed resolutely forward still without haste but with dogged fixity of purpose but the mole now thoroughly alarmed placed himself in front of him and looking into his eyes saw that they were glazed and set and turned a streaked and shifting gray not his friend's eyes but the eyes of some other animal grappling with him strongly he dragged him inside threw him down and held him the rat struggled desperately for a few moments and then his strength seemed suddenly to leave him and he lay still and exhausted with closed eyes trembling presently the mole assisted him to rise and placed him in a chair, where he sat, collapsed and shrunken into himself, his body shaken by a violent shivering, passing in time into an hysterical fit of dry sobbing. Mole made the door fast, threw the satchel into a drawer and locked it, and sat down quietly on the table by his friend, waiting for the strange seizure to pass. Gradually the rat sank into a troubled doze, broken by starts and confused murmurings of things strange and wild and foreign to the unenlightened mole. And from that he passed into a deep slumber. Very anxious in mind, the mole left him for a time, and busied himself with household matters. And it was getting dark when he returned to the parlor, and found the rat where he had left him, wide awake indeed, but listless, silent, and dejected. He took one hasty glance at his eyes, found them, to his great gratification, clear and dark and brown again as before, and then sat down and tried to cheer him up and help him to relate what had happened to him. Poor Ratty did his best, by degrees, to explain things. But how could he put into cold words what had mostly been suggestion? How recall, for another's benefit, the haunting sea-voices that had sung to him, how reproduce at second hand the magic of the seafarer's hundred reminiscences. Even to himself, now the spell was broken and the glamour gone, he found it difficult to account for what had seemed, some hours ago, the inevitable and only thing. It is not surprising, then, that he failed to convey to the mole any clear idea of what he had been through that day. To the mole this much was plain. The fit or attack had passed away, and had left him sane again, though shaken and cast down by the reaction. But he seemed to have lost all interest for the time in the things that went to make up his daily life, as well as in all pleasant forecastings of the altered days and doings that the changing season was surely bringing. 
Casually, then, and with seeming indifference, the Mole turned his talk to the harvest that was being gathered in, the towering wagons and their straining teams, the growing ricks, and the large moon rising over bare acres dotted with sheaves. He talked of the reddening apples around, of the browning nuts, of jams and preserves, and the distilling of cordials, till by easy stages such as these he reached midwinter, his hearty joys and its snug home life, and then he became simply lyrical. By degrees the rat began to sit up and to join in. His dull eye brightened, and he lost some of his listening air. Presently the tactful mole slipped away, and returned with a pencil and a few half-sheets of paper, which he placed on the table at his friend's elbow. "'It's quite a long time since you did any poetry,' he remarked. "'You might have a try at it this evening, instead of, well, brooding over things so much. I've an idea that you'll feel a lot better when you've got something jotted down, if it's only just the rhymes.' The rat pushed the paper away from him wearily, but the discreet mole took occasion to leave the room, and when he peeped in again some time later, the rat was absorbed and deaf to the world, alternately scribbling and sucking the top of his pencil. It is true that he sucked a good deal more than he scribbled, but it was joy to the mole to know that the cure had at least begun. End of chapter 9「Wind in the Willows」by Kenneth Graham Chapter 10 The Further Adventures of Toad The front door of the hollow tree faced eastwards, so Toad was called at an early hour, partly by the bright sunlight streaming in on him, partly by the exceeding coldness of his toes, which made him dream that he was at home in bed in his own handsome room with the Tudor window on a cold winter's night and his bedclothes had got up, grumbling and protesting they couldn't stand the cold any longer, and had run downstairs to the kitchen fire to warm themselves, and he had followed, on bare feet, along miles and miles of icy stone-paved passages, arguing and beseeching them to be reasonable. He would probably have been aroused much earlier had he not slept for some weeks on straw over stone flags, and almost forgotten the friendly feeling of thick blankets pulled well up round the chin. Sitting up, he rubbed his eyes first, and his complaining toes next, wondered for a moment where he was, looking round for a familiar stone wall and little barred window, then with a leap of the heart remembered everything, his escape, his flight, his pursuit, remembered, first and best thing of all, that he was free. Free! The word and the thought alone were worth fifty blankets. He was warm from end to end as he thought of the jolly world outside, waiting eagerly for him to make his triumphal entrance, ready to serve him and play up to him, anxious to help him and to keep him company, as it always had been in days of old before misfortune fell upon him. He shook himself and combed the dry leaves out of his hair with his fingers, and, his toilet complete, marched forth into the comfortable morning sun, cold but confident, hungry but hopeful, all nervous terrors of yesterday dispelled by rest and sleep and frank and heartening sunshine. He had the world all to himself that early summer morning. The dewy woodland, as he threaded it, was solitary and still. The green fields that succeeded the trees were his own to do as he liked with. The road itself, when he reached it, in that loneliness that was everywhere, seemed like a stray dog to be looking anxiously for company. Toad, however, was looking for something that could talk, and tell him clearly which way he ought to go. It is all very well, when you have a light heart and a clear conscience and money in your pocket, and nobody scouring the country for you to drag you off to prison again, to follow where the road beckons and points, not caring whither. The practical toad cared very much indeed, and he could have kicked the road for its helpless silence when every minute was of importance to him. The reserved rustic road was presently joined by a shy little brother, in the shape of a canal, which took its hand and ambled along by its side in perfect confidence, but with the same tongue-tied, uncommunicative attitude towards strangers. "'Bother them,' said Toad to himself. "'But anyhow, one thing's clear. They must 
both be coming from somewhere and going to somewhere. You can't get over that, Toad, my boy. So he marched patiently by the water's edge. Round a bend in the canal came plodding a solitary horse, stooping forward as if in anxious thought. From rope traces attached to his collar stretched a long line, taut, but dipping with his stride, the further part of it dripping pearly drops. Toad let the horse pass, and stood waiting for what the fates were sending him. With a pleasant swirl of quiet water at its blunt bow, the barge slid up alongside of him, its gaily painted gunwale level with the towing path, its sole occupant a big, stout woman, wearing a linen sunbonnet, one brawny arm laid along the tiller. "'A nice morning, ma'am,' she remarked to Toad, as she drew up level with him. "'I dare say it is, ma'am,' responded Toad politely, as he walked along the towpath abreast of her. "'I dare say it is a nice morning to them that's not in sore trouble like what I am. "'Here's my married daughter. She sends off to me post-haste to come to her at once, "'so off I comes, not knowing what may be happening or going to happen, "'but fearing the worst, as you will understand, ma'am, if you're a mother, too. "'And I've left my business to look after itself. "'I'm in the washing and laundering line, you must know, ma'am, "'and I've left my young children to look after themselves, "'and a more mischievous and troublesome set of young imps doesn't exist, ma'am, "'and I've lost all my money and lost my way and as for what may be happening to my married daughter why i don't like to think of it mum where might your married daughter be living mum asked the barge woman she lives near to the river mum replied toad close to a fine house called toad hall that somewheres thereabouts in those parts perhaps you might have heard of it toad hall why well, i'm going that way myself replied the barge woman this canal joins the river some miles further on, a little above Toad Hall, and then it's an easy walk. You come along in the barge with me, and I'll give you a lift. She steered the barge close to the bank, and Toad, with many humble and grateful acknowledgments, stepped lightly on board and sat down with great satisfaction. Toad's luck again, thought he. I always come out on top. So you're in the washing business, ma'am? said the barge woman politely as they glided along. And a very good business you've got too, I dare say, if I'm not making too free in saying so. Finest business in the whole country, said Toad airily. All the gentry come to me, wouldn't go to any one else if they were paid, they know me so well. You see, I understand my work thoroughly, and attend to it all myself, washing, ironing, clear starching, making up gents' fine shirts for evening wear, everything's done under my own eye. But surely you don't do all that work yourself, mum, asked the barge woman respectfully. "'Oh, I have girls,' said Toad lightly. Twenty girls are thereabouts, always at work. "'But you know what girls are, ma'am? "'Nasty little hussies, that's what I call them.' "'So do I, too,' said the barge-woman, with great heartiness. "'But I dare say you set yours to rights, the idle trollops. "'And are you very fond of washing?' "'I love it,' said Toad. "'I simply dote on it. "'Never so happy as when I've got both arms in the wash-tub, "'but then it comes so easy to me. "'No trouble at all, a real pleasure, I assure you, ma'am.' "'What a bit of luck meeting you,' observed the barge-woman, thoughtfully. "'A regular piece of good fortune for both of us.' "'Why, what do you mean?' asked Toad nervously. "'Well, look at me now.' replied the barge-woman. "'I like washing, too, just the same as you, and for that matter, whether I like it or not, I've got to do all me own naturally, moving about as I do. Now, my husband, he's such a feller for shirking his work and leaving the barge to me, that never a moment do I get for seeing to me own affairs. By rights, he ought to be here now, either steering or attending to the horse, though luckily the horse has sense enough to attend to himself, instead of which he's gone off with the dog to see if they can't pick up a rabbit for dinner somewhere. Says he'll catch me up at the next lock. Well, that's as may be. I don't trust him once he gets off with that dog, who's worse than he is. But meantime, how am I to get on with me washing? Oh, never mind about that washing, said Toad, not liking the subject. Try and fix your mind on that rabbit. Nice fat young rabbit, I'll be bound. Got any onions? "'I can't fix my mind on anything but my washing,' said the barge-woman. "'And I wonder you can be talking of rabbits with such a joyful prospect before you. "'There's a heap of things of mine that you'll find in the corner of the cabin. "'If you'll just take 
one or two of the most necessary sort i won't venture to describe them to a lady like you but you'll recognize them at a glance and put them through the wash-tub as we go along why it'll be a pleasure to you as you're rightly say and a real help to me you'll find a tub handy and soap and a kettle on the stove and a bucket to haul up water from the canal with then i shall know you're enjoying yourself instead of sitting here idle looking at the scenery and yawning your head off here you let me steer said toad now thoroughly frightened and then you can get on with your washing your own way i might spoil your things and not do em as you like i'm more used to gentlemen's things myself it's my special line let you steer replied the barge woman laughing it takes some practice to steer a barge properly besides it's dull work and i want you to be happy no you shall do the washing you are so fond of and i'll stick to the steering that i understand don't try and deprive me of the pleasure of giving you a treat toad was fairly cornered he looked for escape this way and that saw that he was too far from the bank for a flying leap and sullenly resigned himself to his fate if it comes to that he thought in desperation i suppose any fool can wash he fetched tub soap and other necessaries from the cabin selected a few garments at random and tried to recollect what he had seen in casual glances through laundry windows and set to a long half-hour passed and every minute of it saw toad getting crosser and crosser nothing that he could do to the things seemed to please them or do them good he tried coaxing he tried slapping he tried punching they smiled back at him out of the tub unconverted happy in their original sin once or twice he looked nervously over his shoulder at the barge woman but she appeared to be gazing out in front of her absorbed in her steering his back ached badly and he noticed with dismay that his paws were beginning to get all crinkly now toad was very proud of his paws he muttered under his breath words that should never pass the lips of either washerwomen or toads and lost the soap for the fiftieth time a burst of laughter made him straighten himself and look round the barge woman was leaning back and laughing unrestrainedly till the tears ran down her cheeks i've been watching you all the time she gasped i thought you must be a humbug all along from the conceited way you talked pretty washerwoman you are never washed so much as a dish clout in your life i'll lay toad's temper which had been simmering viciously for some time now fairly boiled over and he lost all control of himself you common low fat barge woman he shouted don't you dare to talk to your betters like that washer woman indeed i would have you know i'm a toad a very well-known respected distinguished toad i may be under a bit of a cloud at present but i will not be laughed at by a barge woman the woman moved nearer to him and peered under his bonnet keenly and closely why so you are she cried well i never a horrid nasty crawly toad and in my nice clean barge too now that is a thing i will not have she relinquished the tiller for a moment one big mottled arm shot out and caught toad by a foreleg while the other gripped him fast by a hind leg then the world turned suddenly upside down the barge seemed to flit lightly across the sky the wind whistled in his ears and toad found himself flying through the air revolving rapidly as he went the water when he eventually reached it with a loud splash proved quite cold enough for his taste though its chill was not sufficient to quell his proud spirit or slake the heat of his furious temper he rose to the surface spluttering and when he had wiped the duckweed out of his eyes the first thing he saw was the fat barge woman looking back at him over the stern of the retreating barge and laughing and he vowed as he choked and coughed to be even with her he struck out for the shore but the cotton gown greatly impeded his efforts and when at last he touched land he found it hard to climb up the steep bank unassisted he had to take a minute or two's rest to recover his breath then gathering his wet skirts well over his arms he started to run after the barge as fast as his legs would carry him wild with indignation thirsting for revenge the barge woman was still laughing when he drew up level with her put yourself through your mangle washerwoman she called out and iron your face and crimp it and you'll pass for quite a decent-looking toad toad never paused to reply solid revenge was what he wanted not cheap windy verbal triumphs though he had a thing or two in his mind that he would have liked to say he saw what he wanted ahead of him 
Running swiftly on, he overtook the horse, unfastened the tow rope, and cast off, jumped lightly on the horse's back, and urged it to a gallop by kicking it vigorously in the sides. He steered for the open country, abandoning the towpath and swinging his steed down a ruddy lane. Once he looked back and saw the barge had run aground on the other side of the canal, and the barge woman was gesticulating wildly and shouting, "'Stop! Stop! Stop! I've heard that song before!' said Toad, laughing, as he continued to spur his steed onward in its wild career. The barge horse was not capable of any very sustained effort, and its gallop soon subsided into a trot, and its trot into an easy walk, but Toad was quite contented with this, knowing that he, at any rate, was moving, and the barge was not. He had quite recovered his temper, now that he had done something he thought really clever, and he was satisfied to jog along quietly in the sun, steering his horse along byways and bridle paths, and trying to forget how very long it was since he had had a square meal, till the canal had been left very far behind him. He had travelled some miles, his horse and he, and he was feeling drowsy in the hot sunshine, when the horse stopped, lowered his head, and began to nibble at the grass, and Toad, waking up, just saved himself from falling off by an effort. He looked about him and found he was on a wide common, dotted with patches of gorse and bramble as far as he could see. Near him stood a dingy gypsy caravan, and beside it a man was sitting on a bucket, turned upside down, very busy smoking and staring into the wide world. A fire of sticks was burning nearby, and over the fire hung an iron pot, and out of that pot came forth bubblings and gurglings and a vague, suggestive steaminess. Also smells, warm, rich, and varied smells that twined and twisted and wreathed themselves at last into one complete, voluptuous, perfect smell that seemed like the very soul of nature taking form and appearing to her children, a true goddess, a mother of solace and comfort. Toad knew well that he had not been really hungry before. What he had felt earlier in the day had been a mere trifling qualm, this was the real thing at last, and no mistake, and it would have to be dealt with speedily, too, or there would be trouble for somebody or something. He looked the gypsy over carefully, wondering vaguely whether it would be easier to fight him or cajole him. So there he sat, and sniffed, and sniffed, and looked at the gypsy, and the gypsy sat and smoked, and looked at him. Presently the gypsy took his pipe out of his mouth, and remarked in a careless way, "'Want to sell that there horse of yours?' Toad was completely taken aback. He did not know that gypsies were very fond of horse-dealing, and never missed an opportunity, and he had not reflected that caravans were always on the move and took a deal of drawing. It had not occurred to him to turn the horse into cash, but the gypsy's suggestion seemed to smooth the way towards the two things he wanted so badly, ready money and a solid breakfast. "'What?' he said. "'Me sell this beautiful young horse of mine. "'Oh, no, it's out of the question. "'Who's going to take the washing home to my customers every week? "'Besides, I'm too fond of him, and he simply dotes on me.' "'Try and love a donkey,' suggested the gypsy. "'Some people do.' "'You don't seem to see,' continued Toad, "'that this fine horse of mine is a cut above you altogether. "'He's a blood horse, he is. "'Partly, not the part you see, of course, another part.' "'And he's been a prize hackney, too, in his time. "'That was the time before you knew him, "'but you can still tell it on him at a glance "'if you understand anything about horses. "'No, it's not to be thought of for a moment. "'All the same. "'How much might you be disposed to offer me "'for this beautiful young horse of mine?' "'The gypsy looked the horse over, "'and then looked Toad over with equal care, "'and looked at the horse again. in a leg,' he said briefly, and turned away, continuing to smoke, and try to stare the wide world out of countenance. "'A shilling a leg!' cried Toad. "'If you please, I must take a little time to work that out, and see just what it comes to.' He climbed down off his horse, and left it to graze, and sat down by the gypsy, and did sums on his fingers. And at last he said, "'A shilling a leg! Why, that comes to exactly four shillings, and no more! Oh, no, I could not think of accepting four shillings for this beautiful young horse of mine.' "'Well,' said the gypsy, "'I'll tell you what I will do. I'll make it five shillings, and that's three and sixpence more than the animal's worth, and that's my last word.' Then Toad sat and pondered long and deeply, for he was hungry and quite penniless, and still some way 
he knew not how far from home, and enemies might still be looking for him. To one in such a situation, five shillings may well appear a large sum of money. On the other hand, it did not seem very much to get for a horse. But then again, the horse hadn't cost him anything, so whatever he got was all clear profit. At last he said firmly, "'Look here, Gypsy, I'll tell you what we'll do, and this is my last word. You shall hand me over six shillings and sixpence, cash down, and further, in addition thereto, you shall give me as much breakfast as I could possibly eat, and one sitting, of course, out of that iron pot of yours that keeps sending forth such delicious and exciting smells. In return, I will make over to you my spirited young horse, with all the beautiful harness and trappings that are on him, freely thrown in. That's not good enough for you. Say so, and I'll be getting on. I know a man near here has wanted this horse of mine for years. The gypsy grumbled frightfully and declared if he did a few more deals of that sort he'd be ruined. But in the end he lugged a dirty canvas bag out of the depths of his trouser pocket and counted out six shillings and sixpence into Toad's paw. Then he disappeared into the caravan for an instant and returned with a large iron plate and a knife, fork, and spoon. He tilted up the pot, and a glorious stream of hot, rich stew gurgled into the plate. It was indeed the most beautiful stew in the world, being made of partridges and pheasants and chickens and hares and rabbits and peahens and guinea fowls and one or two other things. Toad took the plate on his lap, almost crying, and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed, and kept asking for more, and the gypsy never grudged at him. He thought that he had never eaten so good a breakfast in all his life. When Toad had taken as much stew on board as he thought he could possibly hold, he got up and said good-bye to the gypsy, and took an affectionate farewell of the horse, and the gypsy, who knew the riverside well, gave him directions which way to go, and he set forth on his travels again in the best possible spirits. He was, indeed, a very different Toad from the animal of an hour ago. The sun was shining brightly, his wet clothes were quite dry again, he had money in his pocket once more, he was nearing home and friends and safety, and most and best of all, he had had a substantial meal, hot and nourishing, and felt big and strong and careless and self-confident. As he tramped along gaily, he thought of his adventures and escapes, and how when things seemed at their worst, he had always managed to find a way out and his pride and conceit began to swell within him. Ho, ho, he said to himself as he marched along with his chin in the air. What a clever toad I am! There is surely no animal equal to me for cleverness in the whole world. My enemy shut me up in prison, encircled by sentries, watched day and night by ward as I walk out through them all, by sheer ability coupled with courage. They pursue me with engines and policemen and revolvers. I snap my fingers at them and vanish, laughing into space. I am, unfortunately, thrown into a canal by a woman fat of body and very evil-minded. What of it? I swim ashore, I seize a horse, I ride off in triumph, and I sell the horse for a whole pocket full of money and excellent breakfast. Ho, ho! I am the toad, the handsome, the popular, the successful toad. He got so puffed up with conceit that he made up a song as he walked in praise of himself and sang it at the top of his voice, though there was no one to hear it but him. It was, perhaps, the most conceited song that any animal ever composed. The world has held great heroes, as history books have showed, but never a name to go down to fame compared with that of Toad. The clever man at Oxford know all there is to be known, but they none of them know one half as much as intelligent Mr. Toad. The animals sat in the ark and cried their tears in torrents flowed. Who was it said there's land ahead encouraging Mr. Toad? The army all saluted as they marched along the road. Was it the king or Kitchener? No, it was Mr. Toad. The queen and her ladies-in-waiting sat at the window and sewed. She cried, Look who's that handsome man, they answered, Mr. Toad. There was a great deal more of the same sort, but too dreadfully conceited to be written down. These are some of the milder verses. He sang as he walked, and he walked as he sang, and got more inflated every minute, but his pride was shortly to have a severe fall. After some miles of country lanes he reached the high road, and as he turned into it and glanced along its white length, he saw approaching him a speck that turned into a dot, and then into a blob, and then into something very familiar, and a double note of warning only too well known, 
fell on his delighted ear. "'This is something like,' said the excited Toad. "'This is real life again. "'This is once more the great world from which I have been missed so long. "'I will hail them, my brothers of the wheel, "'and pitch them a yarn of the sort that has been so successful hitherto, "'and they will give me a lift, of course, "'and then I will talk to them some more, and perhaps with luck "'it may even end in my driving up to Toad Hall in a motor-car. "'That will be one in the eye for Badger.' He stepped confidently out into the road to hail the motor-car, which came along at an easy pace, slowing down as it neared the lane, when suddenly he became very pale. His heart turned to water, his knees shook and yielded under him, and he doubled up and collapsed with a sickening pain in his interior. And well he might, the unhappy animal, for the approaching car was the very one he had stolen out of the yard of the Red Lion Hotel on that fatal day when all his troubles began, and the people in it were the very same people he had sat and watched at luncheon in the coffee-room. He sank down in a shabby, miserable heap in the road, murmuring to himself in his despair, "'It's all up. It's all over now. Chains and policemen again. Prison again. Dry bread and water again. Oh, what a fool I have been. Why did I want to go strutting about the country for, singing conceited songs and hailing people in broad day on the high road instead of hiding till nightfall and slipping home quietly by back ways? Oh, hapless toad! Oh, ill-fated animal!' The terrible motor-car drew slowly nearer and nearer, till at last he heard it stop just short of him. Two gentlemen got out and walked round the trembling heap of crumpled misery lying in the road, and one of them said, "'Oh, dear, this is very sad. Here is a poor old thing, a washerwoman, apparently, who has fainted in the road. Perhaps she is overcome by the heat, poor creature, or possibly she—' "'has not had any food to-day. "'Let us lift her into the car "'and take her to the nearest village "'where doubtless she has friends.' "'They tenderly lifted Toad into the motor-car "'and propped him up with soft cushions "'and proceeded on their way. "'When Toad heard them talk in so kind and sympathetic a way "'and knew that he was not recognized, "'he cautiously opened first one eye and then the other. "'Look,' said one of the gentlemen, she is better already. The fresh air is doing her good. How do you feel now, ma'am? Thank you kindly, sir, said Toad, in a feeble voice. I'm feeling a good deal better. That's right, said the gentleman. Now keep quite still, and above all, don't try to talk. I won't, said Toad. I was only thinking if I might sit on the front seat there beside the driver where I could get the fresh air full in my face, I should soon be all right again. What a very sensible woman, said the gentleman. Of course you shall. So they carefully helped Toad into the front seat beside the driver, and on they went again. Toad was almost himself again by now. He sat up, looked about him, and tried to beat down the tremors, the yearnings, the old cravings that rose up and beset him and took possession of him entirely. "'It is fate,' he said to himself. "'Why strive? Why struggle?' And he turned to the driver at his side. "'Please, sir,' he said, "'I wish you would kindly let me try and drive the car for a little. I've been watching you carefully, and it looks so easy and so interesting, and I should like to be able to tell my friends that once I had driven a motor-car.' The driver laughed at the proposal so heartily that the gentleman inquired what the matter was. When he heard, he said to Toad's delight, "'Bravo, ma'am! I like your spirit. Let her have a try and look after her. She won't do any harm.' Toad eagerly scrambled into the seat vacated by the driver, took the steering wheel in his hands, listened with affected humility to the instructions given him, and set the car in motion, but very slowly and carefully at first for he was determined to be prudent. The gentlemen behind clapped their hands and applauded, and Toad heard them saying, "'How well she does it! Fancy a washerwoman driving a car as well as that the first time!' Toad went a little faster, and then faster still, and faster. He heard the gentlemen call out warningly, "'Be careful, washerwoman!' and this annoyed him, and he began to lose his head. 
The driver tried to interfere, but he pinned him down in his seat with one elbow and put on full speed. The rush of air in his face, the hum of the engines, and the light jump of the car beneath him intoxicated his weak brain. Washerwoman, indeed! he shouted recklessly. Ho, ho, I am the toad, the motor car snatcher, the prison breaker, the toad who always escapes. Sit still, and you shall know what driving really is, for you are in the hands of the famous, the skillful, the entirely fearless toad! With a cry of horror, the whole party rose and flung themselves on him. Seize him! they cried. Seize the toad, the wicked animal who stole our motor car. Bind him, chain him, drag him to the nearest police station. Down with the desperate and dangerous toad! Alas, they should have thought. They ought to have been more prudent. They should have remembered to stop the motor car somehow before playing any pranks of that sort. With a half turn of the wheel, the toad sent the car crashing to, through the low hedge that ran along the roadside. One mighty bound, a violent shock, and the wheels of the car were churning up the thick mud of a horse pond. Toad found himself flying through the air with a strong upward rush and delicate curve of a swallow. He liked the motion, and was just beginning to wonder whether it would go on until he developed wings and turned into a toad bird when he landed on his back with a thump in the soft, rich grass of a meadow. Sitting up, he could just see the motor-car in the pond, nearly submerged. The gentleman and the driver, encumbered by their long coats, were floundering helplessly in the water. He picked himself up rapidly, and set off running cross-country as hard as he could, scrambling through hedges, jumping ditches, pounding across fields till he was breathless and weary and had to settle down into an easy walk. When he had recovered his breath somewhat, and was able to think calmly, he began to giggle. And from giggling he took the laughing, and he laughed till he had to sit down under a hedge. Ho, oh, oh, ho, ho! he cried in ecstasies of self-admiration. Toad again! Toad, as usual, comes out on the top! Who was it got them to give him a lift? Who managed to get on the front seat for the sake of fresh air? Who persuaded them into letting him see if he could drive? Who landed them all in a horse pond? Who escaped, flying gaily and unscathed through the air, leaving the narrow-minded, grudging, timid excursionists in the mud where they should rightly be? Why, Toad, of course! Clever Toad! Great Toad! Good Toad! Then he burst into song again and chanted with uplifted voice, The motor car went poop, poop, poop as it raced along the road. Who was it steered it into a pond? Ingenious Mr. Toad! Oh, how clever I am! How clever, how clever, how very clever! A slight noise at a distance behind him made him turn his head and look. Oh, horror! Oh, misery! Oh, despair! About two fields off, a chauffeur in his leather gaiters and two large rural policemen were visible, running towards him as hard as they could go. Poor Toad sprang to his feet and pelted away again, his heart in his mouth. Oh, my! he gasped as he panted along. What an ass I am! What a conceited and heedless ass! Swaggering again, shouting and singing songs again, sitting still and gassing again. Oh, my! Oh, my! Oh, my! He glanced back and saw to his dismay that they were gaining on him. On he ran desperately, but kept looking back and saw that they still gained steadily. He did his best, but he was a fat animal, and his legs were short, and still they gained. He could hear them close behind him now. Ceasing to heed where he was going, he struggled on blindly and wildly, looking back over his shoulder at the now triumphant enemy, when suddenly the earth failed under his feet. He grasped at the air, and splash! He found himself head over ears in the deep water. Rapid water, water that bore him along with a force he could not contend with, and he knew that in his blind panic he had run straight into the river. He rose to the surface and tried to grasp the reeds and the rushes that grew along the water's edge close under the bank, but the stream was so strong that it tore them out of his hands. Oh, my! gasped poor Toad. If I ever steal a motor car again, if I ever sing another conceited song! Then down he went and came up breathless and spluttering. Presently he saw that he was approaching a big dark hole in the bank, just above his head, and as the stream bore him past, he reached up with a paw and caught hold of the edge and held on. Then slowly and with difficulty he drew himself up out of the water, till at last he was able to rest his elbows on the edge of the hole. There he remained for some minutes, puffing and panting, for he was quite exhausted. As he sighed and blew and stared before him into the dark hole, some bright, 
small thing shone and twinkled in its depths, moving towards him. As it approached, a face grew up gradually around it, and it was a familiar face, brown and small, with whiskers, grave and round, with neat ears and silky hair. It was the water rat! End of chapter 10